Um, I'm, uh, I'm Carl Hanson, Chief Executive of the Electricity Authority, and we have uh, Dr. Brent Layton, the Chair of the Electricity Authority, on the top table. And Alistair Dixon, would you join us? Uh, look, before I get started and, and welcome you all here, um, I want to acknowledge the huge contribution that my team have made to get this paper out today uh, and the accompanying material, particularly Alistair Dixon, he's the Principal Advisor for the Market Design Team. Uh, but we also have Pelia Robson and Barbara Sol and uh, um, Brian Ball from Concept uh, and also assistance from Battle Finley. So we've had a lot of uh, uh, top team working on this and I know um, uh, TPM has been going for some time, the TPM review, but uh, uh, we thought this was an appropriate stage in which to call you all together and, and give you a download of uh, I guess this working paper. We've issued a number of working papers over the last uh, year and a bit. Uh, this is the ninth, I understand. Uh, and um, it is just a paper that's setting out options. It's not a proposal. Um, but we do know there's a lot of interest in this. Um, and because it's setting out the full package, uh, each of the three options that we're going to put out to you is the full package that uh, we're currently considering and would be very interested in the feedback um, from you on. Uh, you, we know that's uh, of considerable interest that so we thought would invite uh, people along to a stakeholder briefing and we've had a media briefing earlier today because that's just inevitable when you're looking at this sort of issue. So. Um, I want to acknowledge other board members that are here. We've got uh, David Bull and Roger Sari on the back row there. We've got, uh, I don't see any of the other board members here. They're from the other two. Eleanor Trout and Susan Patterson are from Auckland uh, and uh, they're not here today. So as you know, uh, the authority is charged with making uh, all of its decisions that are consistent with the statutory objective, which is about promoting competition, uh, promoting reliable supply and promoting efficient operation of the electricity industry for the long-term benefit of consumers. So our sole focus is what are the best outcomes for consumers in terms of efficiency. Long-term benefits for consumers are really driven by efficiency gains at the end of the day. Um, overlaying that, you also know that the Commerce Commission is the agency that sets the overall regulatory, the overall revenue pie for uh, regulated parties like Transpower, and the transmission pricing methodology is really about how you divide up that pie. But the underlying story that we uh, have been saying over the last several years is that the way you divide up that pie, the prices that come from that, actually affect the size of the pie, right? So prices affect demand, demand for transmission affects how much transmission is built, how much it is used, that determines the size of the pie. So these things are interrelated, and it's the big part out of this that uh, we think that uh, getting those prices to a more efficient level, one not only gets better, um, better uh, usage and investment uh, size of the grid, but actually affects the way that people participate in the decision-making process around transmission, and that also affects uh, what is decided and what is, um, you know, what, what investment uh, proposals go forward. So with that sort of general introduction, I'll just take you through um, some of the background uh, and uh, the layout of our working paper that were released um, about half an hour ago. The first thing is many of you will know that the current TPM has three main charges, uh, the connection charge, uh, which is really about um, parties with specific assets uh, that are connecting to the main grid, uh, but it also includes uh, some assets a bit deeper into the grid uh, that Transpower is able through their methodology to identify. And so it's known as a deep, a deep kind of connection charge. And that's about 127 million. Then there's the HVDC, of course, connecting the two islands, and that's currently paid for by the South Island generators. Uh, and, uh, and there's a uh, HAMI, historical anytime maximum injection, uh, approach to allocating the revenue requirements from the HVDC across those South Island generators. The third, of course, is the interconnection, the main kind of meshed part of the network, 
and that's paid for mainly by the electricity, electricity distribution businesses and the large consumers. And of course, the EDBs pass it on to retailers, and retailers pass it on to household and commercial consumers that they serve. Um, so that's the bulk of uh, the 632 million is the bulk of the charge. Those charges add up to about 909 million, and uh, that that increment, uh, that 909 million, is a step up from around about 620 million some four or five years ago. So it's about a 45% increase in charges that are coming from the size of the pie increasing, um, and uh, regardless of how you divide it. So we have been uh, we've laid out our uh, what we thought were the problems with the current TPM in our October 2012 proposal. Uh, we have subsequent to that put out a working paper that's uh, called the problem definition working paper that laid out the problems. And in this paper, we are putting essentially the same uh, story out there, the same analysis, but we think we're improving it as we go along the way we articulate it. And so here we really wanted to crystallise for you that we see there being four main problems. The first one is that the current TPM uh, is sending the wrong price signals and it's not particularly adaptable uh, or adaptive to the changing circumstances that happen in the electricity market and on the grid. So for example, we have parties that use uh, the transmission uh, assets, very clearly use the, some transmission assets, and that actually, uh, actually don't pay anything towards them. So we have some industrial consumers in that space, and we also have uh, some generators in that space. We also have circumstances where uh, the, uh, there's a charge, the current interconnection charge, uh, discourages people from using the grid when there's peak demand, but we've had very significant increases in uh, grid capacity. There's plenty of spare capacity, and it just doesn't make economic sense to be deterring people from using a spare capacity that's there. So uh, we see that as the, the wrong price signals coming through, and it's reflecting the fact that the system, the charging system, the TPM, hasn't really been adapting and changing over time. The second kind of core problem is really around the charges not being cost reflective. And that reflects the fact that uh, a number of parties are actually paying charges that far exceed the costs that they uh, impose on the system. And there are others that are not paying when they impose costs on the system. The third kind of, uh, the third problem there is uh, one that we've been very much emphasising since October 2012, and that is that we think that if people are facing prices that reflect either them using the grid or causing the need for grid upgrades or benefiting from grid upgrades, then those kind of prices would actually alter the way that people engage in that decision-making process around transmission investment proposals. And we know uh, from my own engagement with the sector, there have been various parties as I've travelled around the country that have actually said, well, you know, yeah, if we were going to pay for this, we would have actually engaged a lot more. But because they're only paying a fraction of the costs, you can get some uh, network companies, for example, that are actually pretty small, pay a pretty small portion of what's a very large investment that has a big impact on their community. So we know there are some parties out there that have confirmed our, our thinking around that, but uh, you know, we are still interested in uh, a wider perspective on that and, of course, formal submissions, but you know, that's by anecdote. So we, we, uh, we do believe that this is the big issue here, um, that if you have a billion dollars worth of transmission investment deferred by five years, then that creates savings in the order of $300 million at about a 6.8% whack. So there is significant value uh, to be had there if we can get better uh, pricing for transmission. And the last uh, issue there, which is not unrelated to the first three, is that the current TPM isn't particularly durable. We know this because there have been quite a lot of uh, 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 you know, lobbying around uh, around not just the HVDC, but actually around the interconnection. There are a lot of parties that aren't particularly 
uh, accepting of the methodology that's in place. And you can kind of think of it like, um, you know, going out to dinner with your, with your friends and uh, you're at a restaurant. And when you all eat roughly the same amount, you're all pretty much happy to split the bill. But you, you've all had experiences where there's some skinny person at the end of the table uh, who uh, hasn't eaten much and uh, actually uh, will object and say, well, you know, actually, I had a very different portion than you. My bill is only going to be half. And so you start moving into dividing it up. And that's, you know, a sign that when you get people that are lobbying each other and saying, well, look, actually, I'm not really happy with this uh, methodology that we've been using, then uh, it's not particularly durable, particularly if the next time they catch up, a month later at the same restaurant, uh, they decide not to go. So that affects the size of the pie. Okay, so we think that the durability issues are very much about uh, that they are creating uh, uncertainty, and the electricity sector is a very capital intensive sector, not just the lines and transmission, but actually the generation and industrial consumers. So having that uncertainty occurring all the time about the TPM is, uh, is creating costs for consumers via higher charges. Right, so um, this slide is uh, one that you've seen before, I uh, imagine, and uh, what we're really saying here is uh, we uh, consulted on this decision-making framework in uh, 2012, early 2012, and we finalised it uh, in 2012, and there was quite widespread support for it, although a number of parties did say, yeah, well, we buy into it in a way, but we don't think how you're going to be able to apply it. Uh, we hadn't worked out how we would apply it at that stage, but we just proceeded to work through things, and we came up with our October 2012 proposal, which was very much based on this. And since then, we have continued in all of our work to adhere to the framework here, but also to uh, evaluate anything we're doing against our statutory objective, because that is the final test for everything we do. But this is a very useful framework for understanding uh, the various different uh, charging options and why they're in, our, in the mix. So just to come to that, um, what I'm going to give you is just an overview of the key charging methods. Um, we're putting up three suites, three options if you like, and uh, the base option there I'm just illustrating now, and the, you know, the core charges there is the current connection charge. Then, and I said earlier that it's, it's, it's considered to be a deep connection charge, but actually we have been doing some work around making uh, or adopting uh, what we're calling a deeper connection charge. So in addition to the existing connection charge, what we've put in the paper today is a, a methodology for using flow tracing to identify interconnection assets that are actually being used predominantly by just a few parties. So what we are doing in the paper is we do these flow tracing, it's on all the, uh, it uses the actual uh, flows that occurred, and identifies uh, for individual parties their share of the flows on assets, and then we use the herfindahl hirschman index to actually aggregate it up and where the index exceeds 5,000, that's a case where you, for example, could have two parties with 50% of the flows, or you can have more parties, but one of them having the vast bulk of it. Uh, but it's equivalent to two equal parties. Then uh, above that 5,000 threshold, uh, we're saying, well, those interconnection assets would be subject under option, under this base option, would be subject to a deeper connection charge, and the costs of those interconnection assets would be sheeted back home to the parties identified as using them and there are various different ways that that apportionment could occur and that's covered in the paper. Um, now we have also for the deeper connection charge a range so anything above 5,000 on the HHI uh, would be definitely in the deeper connection charge. Uh, anything below 4,000 would not be and between 4,000 and 5,000 on the index, it's a gradation, it's a pro rata. Um, so that's the sort of outline of deeper connection. We can uh, take questions on that um, after the presentation. The third key charge there is the area of benefit. 
And this is essentially what used to be, we used to call the GIT charge, the Grid Investment Test Charge. The GIT charge we had previously consulted on in our beneficiary pays working paper. Oh, before I go further, I should say the deeper connection charge, we have a companion paper uh, because we realise that that's a new methodology that uh, we haven't previously consulted on. So we've covered it in the working paper, but there's also a companion paper. On the uh, area benefit charge, um, it was previously called the GIT charge, which just applied to reliability investments. Uh, there were suggestions from some stakeholders that, well, actually, you could apply that to both economic and reliability investments. And uh, we looked at that, and we think that's, that's practicable. Uh, so we have uh, proceeded to create this area of benefit charge. Essentially, what it does is it takes, uh, at the time that investment proposals are being put forward to the Commerce Commission, Transpower has to identify the benefits relative to the costs, and if the benefits exceed the costs, then presumably uh, it gets approved. Well, the area of benefit charge essentially takes those benefits and says, well, where do those benefits occur? Where do they lie? And then the costs of that investment would be allocated in proportion to the anticipated benefits. And with the area of benefit charge, um, uh, there is a, an adjustment mechanism we'll talk about later. The capacity-based residual charge, um, similar to October 2012, where we had a residual charge to collect the remaining amount of revenue that's needed to make Transpower whole, but we've focused it on being capacity-based, and we'll talk a bit about that later. And we've also uh, moved away from uh, having it split 50-50 between generation and retail, and this option, uh, it would be uh, entirely on load parties. And just down the bottom there, I'll just note in small, you know, we're, I'm just putting aside the, the LCE credit and the KVAR charge, the relatively technical uh, adjustments um, yeah, that we don't want to get sidetracked on here. So that's the base option. Uh, the base option plus LRMC, as the title says, is just the base option plus adding in a long run marginal cost charge. And the reason for that is the LRMC, of course, is a. Um, a charge for uh, periods when the transmission grid is starting to get congested and Transpower is starting to plan uh, to make investments to expand the grid. So if you have a price signal that reflects the LRMC of that investment, uh, then parties will decide whether they're going to use the grid and continue to uh, congest it even further and the investment will occur or perhaps they will decide not to use it at the same time and uh, reduce the, uh, the congestion and therefore avoid the investment. So that's, uh, that's a theoretically efficient charge and we're talking about putting that in, uh, adopting a marginal investment cost approach to that. And then the uh, third uh, option is really around uh, the base without the LRMC but reverting to that SPD charge that we had talked about in October 2012. Um, that SPD charge is basically the one that we modified in a working paper, but with some further modifications I'll talk about soon. And then the last component, oops, we did not slip that, slip that slide. Uh, the last component here is that uh, we have listened to stakeholders, and a number of stakeholders have said, well, look, you know, if you're going to have new charging methods, just apply them to new assets and new investments, so that's application B. And of course, as new investments occur and the old grid phases out, the new charges will phase in uh, as an overall system-wide perspective. Of course, if you're any particular customer, such as uh, uh, you know, a particular network and there's a grid upgrade into your area, there would be a step change, right? Because you get a new asset and new benefits under application B, you would get a step change in your benefits and a step change in your charges that reflect that. But overall, as a system-wide, it would, you know, it automatically phases in and it's fairly gradual. Application A is like the same in a way that we've been talking about since October 2012, which is essentially applying the new charges to both new and existing assets um, there's a few uh, tweaks to that. The deeper connection charge would apply to any uh, historical asset, uh, whereas the area of benefit and the SPD charge would apply to assets uh, from May 2004 
that had been approved or uh, or um, proposed, I think it is. Um, so there's quite a difference in the impact between those two applications. And so we have, uh, and the board is considering uh, transition options, and there's four transition options that we outline in the paper uh, for application A. I've got to remember to flick it over there. Right, so just to give you some uh, further details about the about the charges, uh, the deeper connection charge, um, talked a bit about that already. Why are we considering it? Well, essentially, as I said at the start, we are interested in targeting the charges to parties that use or cause or benefit from uh, the grid. And so this one is about uh, targeting the charges to parties uh, where there's a predominantly a small number of parties, or a small number of parties that predominantly use parts of the interconnection system. And so uh, we've put it in each of the three options because it's actually higher up in the hierarchy than beneficiary pays. It's a market-like type regime because it's like the connection assets. Okay, parties can contract for it and the deeper connection charge is something where a small number of parties, maybe two but maybe more, maybe five, can get together and believe that there's uh, benefits from a transmission investment and they can go and contract with Transpower for that if they wish. So we are viewing it as a market-like charge and it's much higher up in the hierarchy than beneficiary pays. And we think uh, it provides the right kind of incentives. For example, if you're a distributor and you're looking at you could make some investments in your own network under the current TPM, you are uh, actually very incentivized, whether people do this or not, you're very incentivized to convince uh, the transmission company to build transmission because then you only pay for a fraction. If you make your own investment as a distributor, you've got to pay for 100% and uh, sheet that home to your customers. So there's very strong incentives there. So we think the deeper connection charge addresses that to quite a significant extent. The features in terms of applying it is that, um, is that uh, we propose to calculate or well, recalculate uh, the coverage of it every five years or so, uh, or potentially have a threshold in there where we use a mechanism, uh, a methodology to calculate actual benefits, compare it to the anticipated benefits, and when they diverge, uh, there would be a threshold in which that would trigger uh, recalculating the deeper connection charge. And the idea is to allocate that deeper connection charge according to AMD or AMI at it relevant uh, connection node. But I think there's other, um, there's other allocation, allocation methodologies in the paper, so this is just for the purposes of having to find and, and present to you some of the numerical impacts. We had to choose one of the options to do that. So consistent with the current connection charge? Yes, that, that's... that's so yeah, so that's um, cons consistent with the current connection charge. So that's a useful, uh, you know, comparison. So under application B, the deeper connection charge would only apply to future investments uh, and assets, whereas under application B, uh, application A would apply to all existing or potentially to all existing assets, depending whether they meet the thresholds. Uh, this chart is to show you um, what, which of the interconnection assets uh, tend to be captured by uh, this deeper connection charge based on that threshold of a 5,000 HHI and then graduated from 4,000 to 5,000. Uh, so where it graduates, say it's 4,500, then 50% of the value of the asset would be covered from deeper connection and 50% from elsewhere. So you can see that um, uh, there's quite a few assets uh, covered there for both load and generation. Uh, probably quite notable that the Wairaki ring, around about 50, I think it's 50% of the Wairaki ring would be paid for by <coughs> generators under this methodology. But particularly the uh, Naigu and the Naan and various other upgrades are uh, captured by uh, the deeper connection charge. Uh, so this leaves really uh, the HVDC and um, one or two other upgrades to be captured by area benefit or other beneficiary pays. The incidence of the deeper connection charge, um, very much... 
under application A. Yes, it should have in the heading there that this is the incidence under application A. Um, so you can see that uh, it affects the west coast area, particularly west power area, because there were quite significant upgrades into that area being driven largely by uh, dairy demand. It's the fastest, one of the fastest growing uh, areas for uh, electricity consumption, and that's been driven by dairy, but also, uh, you know, there was the Pike River mine and other uh, industrial activities there, and uh, so that led to a transmission upgrade. Of course, to the extent that uh, some of those businesses are no longer operating or their demand now is substantially less, um, you know, there could be a case for, uh, well, the transmission options that we're looking at would affect uh, the charges there. Uh, the uh, deeper connection charge also affects Auckland and Northland uh, greater than the other areas. And that's really reflecting that those grid upgrades, the NAN and the NIAGAP and so on, were ac they're actually delivering juice through to those areas. So they're essentially lowering energy prices in the spot market for those areas and they're lowering losses and they are lowering, they're improving uh, reliability into that area. So that's what's driving, um, you know, the deeper connection charge, although it's not a beneficiary pays, people, you know, usage of the asset is going to give rise to those benefits. So, um, so the, the charges will be related to the benefits uh, in that sense. The second uh, one on my list is this long run marginal cost charge and uh, we had in the working paper consulted on three different definitions of the LRMC but the theoretically correct one, the most efficient one, is the one based on marginal um, incremental costs, MIC, and that's what we have included in our modelling and what we've uh, put into the base option plus LRMC. We're considering this charge because, you, as I was saying earlier, you want to have prices reflecting uh, impending investment uh, so people can adjust their behaviour and avoid the investment if that is of value to them. If it isn't, they'll continue to, uh, to use the transmission assets and the investment will occur. The features around it are really that um, we will apply the deeper connection charge first and so the LRMC would apply to any new investment that wasn't covered by the deeper connection charge. So if there are new investments, we will do the HHI. If it's covered by the deeper connection, then it goes there. If it isn't, it will then be potentially caught by the LRMC. The reason for that is you're know, anticipating, knowing that, you get, that a new investment is going to be covered by deeper connection provides the signals that you need to, uh, to alter your demand. Um, of course, it applies to both generation and load, and um, it's a, we're suggesting we'd apply it according to net capacity required by the participant when the system is becoming increasingly congested. So it's not applied on peak demand, it's applied on the gap between uh, the use of the assets and the capacity, so congestion. So as congestion gets worse, the LRMC would bite more. Uh, the ess essence of this uh, charge, even though it's kind of got all those great hallmarks that economists like about um, uh, charges, it actually doesn't raise a great deal of revenue, uh, very minimal amount of revenue to start with, and there's no reason to think that it would recover anywhere enough to pay for uh, grid assets, so um, you know, we definitely need other charges if we were using the LRMC. The area of benefit, as I was saying before, this one's based on allocating according to anticipated benefits, uh, and there would be a, an adjustment mechanism that would be put in place. Uh, the board certainly feels that uh, we need to have a charging mechanism that's adaptable over time. The reason for the area of benefit charge is really wanting to target the charges moving away from this even spreading under interconnection charges currently, they're even spreading, moving towards uh, a targeted charge uh, to get parties uh, facing price signals that relate to uh, their demand for the, uh, for the transmission assets. And, and we just note that the Midwest independent system operator in the US has uh, this kind of charge in place, so it's very practicable, uh, or potentially is in New Zealand. Um, so it applies to both generation and load, and under application A, 
uh, we would suggest the same kind of cutoff we've talked about previously for SPD, for this area benefit, uh, for investments after 28th of May 2004 that exceed $50 million, and for any new investment from uh, now on or 2017 on, uh, it would be uh, approved or commissioned if they were exceeding $20 million, and possibly poll too. The SPD charge, uh, you're probably all very familiar with this one. Uh, it's based on actual benefits received, estimated using SPD model runs. Um, and uh, it is a charge that, uh, why, would we, why would we want to look at SPD if we're doing area benefit? Well, the main advantage is, one, it's based on actual benefits rather than anticipated benefits. But secondly, it's automatically adjusts. Uh, and that's one of the features that is particularly attractive to the board, uh, but uh, you know it, it, the area of benefit charge would fully recover the revenue required for individual assets, where the SPD charge doesn't necessarily. So we have a bit of a, a trade-off there uh, between the two. And in the base option plus SPD, we're talking about applying the SPD charge first, and then to the extent that there's a revenue gap for a particular asset we would apply the area of benefit charge to mop that up. So the idea being that under the area of benefit, you know, someone has gone and calculated the lifetime benefits, the benefits relating to a lifetime of an asset, compared it to the lifetime costs, it would make sense if there's a gap in the revenue to allocate the, the remaining costs through to those that are benefiting over the lifetime of the asset, rather than spreading it through the residual charge. So that's the essential... Uh, thinking behind that and the features for applying it are really that uh, we think that maybe applying it on a net basis is a lot more consistent with investment decision making. As an investor, you of course make investment decisions based on the net benefit uh, you would receive, not the gross benefit. We've been looking at the various, various capping periods in the previous working paper. The focus had been, or the kind of, we'd kind of favoured a, a daily capping and I think we're kind of favouring a monthly capping here, but we are not fixed on these things. Uh, another change is that for those with distributed generation, uh, that it would be based on a net rather than gross injection, uh, and that the important aspect of the SPD charge is that uh, it would be based on the previous uh, three years, I think it is, Alistair, three years of uh, uh, data, so we'd calculate it over the previous three years and then it would be charged over the year ahead. So it would be known. And I think that addresses a lot of the concerns that, uh, that parties had with it. Not all of them, there are other concerns, but that was a major one. The residual charge, so uh, it's essentially a postage stamp, but it's on, low, on load only. We had thought about... Uh, the price signalling, and we think that with the other charges further up the hierarchy in that list, we're providing the kind of price signals that will lead to better investment decisions and better use of the grid. So the purpose of the residual charge is really just to recover remaining revenue. Uh, and if you have the area benefit charge and a deeper connection charge, etc., you're recovering all the revenue you need for new assets. So the purpose of the residual charge is really to recover uh, the gap in revenue on existing assets, okay? Uh, and so we had thought uh, back in October 2012, we had suggested the residual charge be applied 50-50 from uh, between generation and load. We have given further thought to that and have decided that while doing so, you know, applying such a, a charge so, so commonly across all of the generators probably just really result in it being variableized, and in, in other words, it being added to the energy price, and so it will come through as a kilowatt hour charge, and uh, that's not as efficient as a capacity charge. So we thought if we uh, actually just have it apply to load and calculate it on the basis of capacity, then that would be a more efficient outcome in terms of uh, treating in consumers. So we're considering it mostly just to recover the revenue, but also to get better investment outcomes with the way we've structured the charge. It would be better than the RCPD or the megawatt, megawatt hour charge. Um, now, for distribution businesses, we're talking about actually adding up the capacity of their connections uh, based on metering, metering category, category code and allocating 
uh, this residual according to distribution companies' share of capacity on that basis. There's a little bit of an issue with industrial consumers because there um, are circumstances where uh, due to the existing charging mechanism and other circumstances, the capacity, the thermal capacity of thermal of industrial consumers uh, can be well in excess of what they actually use. So we've decided to look at the AMD for that, of allocating across industrial consumers. And as I said before, it wouldn't be allocated, uh, not allocated to retailers, it gets allocated to EDBs. And of course then they'll charge through to retailers. So I gave that simpler table earlier on. This is the full Monty here. Um, it's the full list of uh, charges under each option and uh, relates it to the decision-making and economic framework that uh, we talked about earlier. Um, we go down this list from market to market-like. Uh, so the existing connection and the deeper connection are in that category, as is the LRMC charge, um, because in a workably competitive market, Businesses over the longer term charge prices to recover LRMC. Uh, then we have the KVAR charge, which is to deal with essentially with externalities uh, from the power quality uh, factor, and then the beneficiary pays charges, SPD and area of benefit, and then uh, really just the residual charge, which is the mop up uh, to make Transpower whole. So I talked earlier about there being two possible applications. Uh, Application A and B we've talked about. I think I can skip through this uh, and talk more. Probably, can people see the words on that? Avoid me having to read it all out. So what we have in the paper is a table that essentially uh, makes uh, tries to clarify for you, make it very clear for you what we mean by application A and B. So for the deeper connection charge, it would apply to potentially apply to all existing assets. Uh, and, of course, new assets under application A. Uh, the area of benefit just for post-2004, same for SPD, and potentially Pole 2 is the exception for both of those. We haven't got a firm view on Pole 2. Um, one of the reasons why it's included is that it does seem uh, like if you're going to apply it to Pole 3, Pole 2 is delivering the same service, and it does seem like there would be an inconsistency there uh, to have a different uh, application to Pole 2 and Pole 3. I mean, you potentially could have the deeper connection charge on Pole 2 or on the, any of the HVDC. Um, residual charge, uh, so as I was saying earlier, the residual charge is really under application A to recover revenue that uh, is on existing assets and, you know, um, it wouldn't be needed for new uh, new investments. Application B, only to new assets, and the key thing there is that the residual charge would be using the status quo technology, the status quo pricing method methodologies to recover uh, revenue on uh, existing assets. And that includes the... Uh, yeah, it includes the uh, current uh, interconnection charge. Yeah, yeah, I've got the HVDC there. I'm just wondering, Alistair, the, uh, the, for the residual charge here, interconnection, that's the RCPD w w that would be applying RCPD yeah, RCP. under application B. So it is essentially just the status quo uh, to existing assets and only applying the new methods to new assets. So this table is intended to give you a big picture perspective of the impacts of application A and B and each of the options. You can see there that under application A, uh, regardless of which of the options we choose, the revenue uh, collection is roughly about the same. You can see in the base option, uh, you know, for the deeper connection and the residual roughly about the same in each of those three options. Uh, you can see in the middle one there, you might, might not be able to see it, but there's a, a very thin purple line around about the $500 million mark. Um, it doesn't collect $500 million, it's about <laughs> it's a tiny amount there. That's the long run marginal cost charge. Uh, it's not visible because we're looking at this from the 2017 to 2019. Of course, in the future there may be, there will in an undoubtedly be transmission investments and the LRMC charge could be substantially larger. Um, but uh, for the uh, modelled period, it, it came out, it was very small, and similarly the orange there is the SPD charge um, covering some of the 
beneficiary pays. So you can see a big difference between application A and B. The, the choice between those two applications really does drive very much the impact on customer groups, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but also the design of the deeper connection charge. If we lowered the HHI threshold, that would have quite a significant or, or increase that would have quite a significant impact. Or if we altered the way that we allocated in the model uh, the do, uh, deeper connection charge across parties, that would alter um, uh, these uh, numbers. And of course the design of the residual charge. So um, uh, your application B here, this is just for 2017-19 and it shows very small uh, collect revenue collection for deeper connection, SPD, LRMC, area of benefit, and that's simply because if you're applying them to new assets, you have to have a period of time of new assets coming on board before it grows. So you can expect by 2035 the, you know, the colour there would be really quite different. Uh, the black and the uh, orange and the uh, red would grow over time. And that's all compared to the current TPM. So this is the impact of application B, the one that doesn't, uh, that just applies the new charges to new assets. And no surprise really here, I mean, relative to the purple, which is the status quo, uh, any of the options that were put up don't really have a material change in the impact in the 2017 to 19 period. So that's sort of initially it's very similar. But the thing to appreciate with application B is although the numbers haven't changed much, the pricing signals at the margin are very different from the current TPM. Okay. So under uh, the uh, uh, application B, any new investment, people will be facing the right price signals for it. The other thing to, um, to take into account for both this chart and the next one, and a few others uh, in this presentation, is that they do not include uh, the benefits that parties have got from transmission investments. So we're just looking at the reallocation of the transmission costs here. Um, and also they don't include any dynamics. So as we're saying right at the start, the way that you charge people affects the size of the pie. Uh, we haven't taken into account the impact on the size of the pie because that's a dynamic that will play out over time. So you can see here uh, very much um, uh, similar to the status quo, but don't be fooled by it. Uh, under application A, uh, essentially it... Uh, it means under the you know with the deeper connection charge, you've got generators in the North Island that would be paying more relative to the status quo because some of the assets they'll be caught by, but also of course some of the SPD and area of benefit charges would uh, would be shared at home to uh, generation. You see a reduction relative to the status quo for South Island generation, um, and that's uh, largely driven by uh, the HVDC. Um, charges coming off South Island generation and being allocated via the area of benefit and SPD. Of course, some of that does go to generation, but uh, not all of it. Um, you see on the far right-hand side um, reductions for industrials. Uh, the one exception there would be Norskiskug, um, but as an average, uh, the industrials would get a reduction. Um, yeah, the reason why Norsis Goog is the exception is that under the current methodology, they're managing to arrange their uh, demand such that they, uh, they don't have any demand for on the transmission system at the time of regional coincident peak, and so they're paying zero interconnection fees. Uh, so under application A uh, or B, we are proposing that uh, they would pay for some of the interconnection. Under A, it would be just driven by the same methodology as everybody else. Under application B, we're saying, well, any party should at least pay the variable costs. Okay, so for transmission assets, interconnection assets, there's something orders about 300 million, Alistair, of 250 million of, of variable costs. It's not, it's not chicken feed, it's, it, that's annually. So, and that's only just some of it. So, uh, you know, it's important that if parties are going to use the assets and actually create variable costs, we think it's efficient that they actually face charges reflecting that. So even under application B, the one exception is that any party that 
uh, isn't paying at least the variable costs would would be required to pay that. And and yeah, you know, there'll be others in that camp as well. But Norskiskirg is probably the the most um, the easiest one to think about. Uh, New Zealand aluminium smelters under application A would have something in the order of about a $50 million reduction in charges. And that just reflects the fact that when you do the deeper connection charge, there's already the main connection asset, and you do that deeper connection charge through the interconnection on the interconnection assets, then uh, actually the juice doesn't flow to them. And then the area benefit and SPD charges don't um, don't sheet home to them very much either. So that's just an outcome of the modelling. Um, and then, of course, uh, we're seeing the uh, the charges uh, for some of the HVDC go on to the UNI, the Upper North Island Mass Market Load. Pretty much the Lower North Island Mass Market is uh, not hugely affected, but there are some exceptions I'll show you in a minute. And the South Island Mass Market Load will get a little bit of a reduction. See if we can move this. So this is uh, the regional distribution, uh, equivalent to what you've just seen under application A. So we're assuming here no transition arrangements, and we have in the paper four transmission, uh, transition arrangements uh, under application A. And these are the charge rates. So the previous chart was the dollars, the millions of dollars. This is the charge rates, dollars per megawatt hour. And you can see that... Uh, uh, that the um, under each of the options there isn't a great deal of variation uh, between them. Oh, um, that's the delta, not the absolute charge. Oh, thank you. So this is the uh, change in charges. So, okay. So what it means is uh, those that are dark red. Um, for those that can't see from the back, perhaps uh, that would be a twenty-five dollars per megawatt hour increase in transmission charge in those areas. So that's what the three options under application A. Uh, at the household level, you know, at the final bill level, uh, we know that um, transmission is about 10 to 11 percent of the final uh, household bill. Uh, so we've calculated it through, and um, you can see from the red areas of the previous slide that uh, the increases around the top energy, the far north and uh, West Power, which is in the West Coast area, uh, would amount to in the order of about 10% change in uh, the final household price for electricity. But I have to stress, this is without the transition options. Um, the four main er five main areas there, particularly uh, counties, uh, Capity, which is Electra, Marlborough, um, and of course Auckland and Northland, uh, there's an increase of around about 4 Four and a half percent for those areas. Quite a lot of areas, no real significant change, and then around about two percent reduction in a in a number of other areas. This is uh, taking the transmission component and working out how much it would actually in percentage increase your total final electricity bill. Yep. So it's the uh, ten percent. Suppose. Uh, Consumers in top energy are uh, paying 24 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity, then that would be a 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour increase. Okay. Any other questions about that? So as with the previous slide, this does not take into account the, the impact on the pie, the dynamics. It doesn't take any account of the benefits. We're just working out the costs. Now, of course, areas here that that have paying higher charges because they're more targeted, they're actually receiving the benefits from the transmission grids upgrades. And you know, if you counted those in, then that would reduce the uh, positive numbers, the 10 and the 4.5% down. So that leads on to this slide where what I'm saying is, you know, it's very important that people don't just focus on the transmission charge and the changes in the charge, you really need to be focusing on the benefits that people get from those upgrades. And, uh, you know, if we have an approval process that says, well, we will approve grid investments when they deliver more benefits than the economic costs, then someone's receiving those benefits, right? So there ought to be situations where the 
parties receiving the benefits have got more benefits than the increase in charges. Now, actually, a lot of the grid investments are already commissioned and they're already delivering the benefits. So relative to the status quo, it's an increase in charges. But I think you know, it would be reasonable to think that uh, you need to uh, relate it to the benefits people are coming through and look at the net effect. The other thing that's really quite apparent is that um, a change to uh, application A or B uh, involves trade-offs and there are inev inevitable tensions. Under application A, of course, uh, those regions or parties that uh, you know, got a price increase, they're receiving the benefits of the, uh, of the grid upgrades. Um, but even under application B, there's little change in there, but that means parties that are overpaying will continue to overpay because they're paying for other parties' grid upgrades. So there's an inev inevitable tension here, and whatever we do, we're going to have that tension. Uh, and uh, so what we've been looking at with application A was a number of transition options, and I'll talk about those now. Four options uh, for transition. We're very open to hearing about other options, other ways of doing it, of course, as with the rest of the paper. Um, but ones that came to mind to our team was to cap uh, the rate or the cap the transmission charges uh, at the upper quartile of all pre-capped rates for EDBs. So that's been calculated at around about twenty-two dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, and that would be funded by, you know, you got, you, you know, the charge under no transition would go to here, you're capping it here, there's a gap, you need to fund that, and we would do that by spreading it around um, all the EDBs. Uh, so those that uh, get a price reduction relative to no transition are going to be funded by, under that option, uh, by parties that, that will uh, have to pay more. Capping uh, option two, transition option two, is capping the, in the essentially the rate of increase in transmission charges. So we'll cap it at 5% uh, at of the domestic retail tariff, for example. That's around about $12.5 per megawatt hour. If you've got 24 cents per kilowatt hour retail charge, then 5% of that is 1.25 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and that also would be funded from other EDBs. The third one was really around uh, capping the annual increase in transmission charges uh, so it doesn't increase by more than 20% uh, in any particular year, and that would be funded by keeping the existing status quo charges in place. So you would you know, keep your HVDC and your interconnection charge in place uh, to fund that, and you would rate it down. And of course, transition option four is just more of a simpler version. It just says, well, let's do it over five years. We'll have the new charges coming in. Uh, you calculate both the status quo and the new, and then uh, um, you, you charge 20% of the new and 80% of the existing for the first year, and then in the following year it will be 40, 60, you know, and it just moves over five years and you phase it in. So just to finish off, uh, we're very much uh, we're looking forward to getting this paper out the door. Um, it's been, I think you can see that it's, we've put a lot of thought into not just how to divide up that pie to get a better uh, outcome for the community overall and particularly for consumers uh, over, the, over time, um, but also to look at transition options and look at the effects of different ways of doing things. And we will be releasing on our website uh, all the analysis that we can and all the numerical stuff we can. Later in the week we will be releasing uh, the uh, uh, numbers around the transition options. Uh, we were just reviewing it last night and I uh, spotted something, you know, we, we spotted inconsistencies in the table around the transition options. So rather than put that out, we just need to rework it and then we'll get it out to you as soon as we can. Uh, so this is just the first of the stakeholder meetings. Uh, the team and myself and the chair are actually meeting with other parties through the rest of this week on one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, the uh, team will go further than this week um, into July on that, and there'll be workshops uh, for group discussion and evaluation. And then uh, we'll be looking at uh, um, 
receiving your submissions by the 11th of August 2015. And I think as we previously published, we're looking at uh, uh, potentially having a, uh, an issues paper in 2016, early 2016, and final decisions wrapped up by 30th of June 2016. All right, that is the last one. So, uh, I'm very happy to take initial questions. <laughs>